Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, your host. Thank you very much for inviting me into your home again this week. Uh, as you can see, I am joined by two guests this week, a rarity. Usually it's just one-on-one. But And I'm going to, I, I really hope I do not <laughs> butcher their names in the process of this. I tried to clarify before we got started, but I am welcoming this week Dan uh, Daniel Barbin-Levin. Did I get that mm-hmm. right? Okay, yeah, good. Daniel, thank you and welcome to my show. And uh, Zach Heinzerling, yes? Yes. Excellent. Okay. I am welcoming these two to my show as Dan is a survivor of a what we might call a one-on-one or a sort of guru cult situation that went on for many, many years, starting with Dan's uh, uh, college years. Mm-hmm. at Sarah Lawrence University. And this has been discussed and talked about in the media and the particular cult leader that we're talking about, a man named Larry Ray, is now in jail. And he's in jail for the next 60 years. And being that he's already 63 years old, we're not particularly anticipating that Larry's coming out of jail anytime soon or ever. Um, and then Zach is the producer, developer, writer, or sorry, director of this documentary that was put together that I got a chance to preview. They were they sent it to me and gave me this opportunity, and I grabbed it because it was a good one, and this documentary is incredible. It's called Stolen Youth. It will be on Hulu, uh, premiering February 9th, and I have a rare opportunity here. You know, usually I'm talking to people uh, whose stories have already been told in the media or, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not like some news breaking uh, podcast here. But this is quite a story. And it goes fully in line with uh, everything we talk about on this channel in terms of gaslighting, psychological and physical manipulation and control, basically all the elements of coercive control concentrated in this story with, um, with a, a small group of college students who were taken in by and controlled, ultimately controlled by this man named Larry Ray. So welcome to my show, guys. Uh, there's my little intro. How did I do? I thought you great. did great. Okay, good. Pretty accurate? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay, good. So Dan, as the person who lived with and survived this for so many years, um, do you want to maybe, and, and Zach, of course, uh, help with this, can you give us a short summary first for those who really aren't familiar with this at all, to haven't had any exposure to it? I am now well steeped in this whole story, and it's quite something. But can you tell it from your perspective? Yeah. So I'll say, in general, a part of the value of this documentary for me is that it um, does such a good job giving the nuances of this whole story from beginning to end. Um, and it's really difficult, as you know, with any complicated experience of being pulled into a coercive group to distill it. But um, essentially, I went to Sarah Lawrence College, um, was there as a freshman and made a group of friends, including Talia Ray, um, who I would later learn is Larry Ray's daughter. Um, Talia, from the beginning, was telling stories about her dad, uh, who was this hero, this incredibly smart and effective guy. He was a Marine. He was doing overseas intelligence work, this sort of international man of mystery. Um, And he had also been a whistleblower who was unjustly incarcerated. This is all according to Talia. Uh, In sophomore year, she spearheaded us all moving into a house together at Sarah Lawrence. This was uh, sort of like a townhouse, not exactly a dorm, um, but sort of like its own home. Uh, There were eight of us. And at a certain point during sophomore year, she said, uh, my dad's getting out of prison uh, and he needs a place to crash while he gets his feet back under him. And uh, would that be okay? And, you know, we had all heard the stories of Talia being separated from her dad and all she'd ever wanted was to be, it was like all she talked about was reuniting with her dad. Mm -hmm. So we all were fine with it. Um, And that sort of let this man in the door who, uh, you know, as things progressed, 
he's, you know, he started cooking us meals. He started having conversations with my friends about philosophy and truth and all of these things, which were conversations we were already having at school, but he really took control of the whole environment. Um, and then uh, later on, he got an apartment in Manhattan. Uh, a bunch of my friends, including me, uh, at a later point, moved into that apartment. It escalated into physical, sexual abuse, uh, all under Larry's Ray, Larry Ray's control. Uh, and then that progressed even further after I left, which the documentary gives like the full picture. Yeah. Right. You were one of the first to get away from that circle uh, because there was uh, it. And one of the things that I'm going to say right away is most powerful about this documentary is that it's not just testimonials and recreations. There are uh, there's a tremendous library, apparently, of video taken uh, at the behest of Larry. Uh, of his abuses, of his abusive behavior. He, apparently, he was kind of into documenting all of it. Um, mm -hmm. What was the reasoning given to you guys why a camera was on all the time? I'm just curious about that to start with. Yeah, Larry, um, from the beginning, claimed that he, uh, or, or I should say, once he began to turn the screws um and things sort of turned the corner into abuse. He started documenting things, he said, because we had been um, sabotaging him, damaging his things. Everything was predicated on this claim that we were trying to harm him. And so that was the reason for the harm he was enacting on us. Um, and he recorded everything as evidence, he said, against us, which ironically turned out to be evidence against him. Exactly. D and, and such a bizarre mindset to do that. But, but, you know, I watching this was uh, revelatory. It was very, very interesting to watch where this man went with all of this and how he conducted his life outside of the social group he had created with you guys, because he had kind of a whole second life thing going on in the political realm and with some fairly high powered people, New York commissioner of police or something. I mean, there were some connections there that that were kind of important, but but that whole thing was all separate from what he was doing with you guys. Yeah, a part of what I, I and I'm sure you can speak to this from your own experience, part of what's really disorienting about being around a person like Larry Ray or around these sort of controlling, uh, maybe fair to say like con men type personalities is um, it's very hard to know what's true and what's false. Um, he's very good at uh, inflating certain types of relationships and leveraging. Um, so, you know, he might have uh, met a sort of an important figure once and he could turn that into a whole source of uh, a story about his sort of life and his connections and how important he is. But uh, from knowing him, it seems as if he essentially sort of leapfrogged from important person to important person and use these connections to slowly make himself seem more and more uh, important. Um, but yes, he, you know, he did very much have a relationship with Bernard Carrick, who was the police commissioner of New York. He, you know, was the best man at Bernie Carrick's wedding. Uh, but this for him became the source of this whole giant conspiracy and what was true and what wasn't. Um, it's very hard to distinguish. Um, I mean, honestly, Zach will know more about the reality than I would. Oh, absolutely. Well, that, and that was, that was part of the whole point of it was how masterful he was at manipulating each individual situation he'd find himself in to his advantage. And I found that very L. Ron Hubbard-like. Uh, from my mm -hmm. own experience, right, right, with Scientology, is L. Ron Hubbard was a master manipulator in the same mold. He was a pathological liar who could twist facts and distort reality right in front of you. And he was the kind of person who people had mentioned you could go in angry with him over something, and he would somehow turn it all around on you, and you would walk out of that conversation absolutely sure not only was he not a bad guy he was the good guy and you were bad for even questioning him in the first place and i wanted to ask dan did you ever experience that with him 
Oh yeah, constantly. I mean, the situation was so tightly controlled that it would have been very hard to even go into a room with Larry with the intention to call him out for something. I, I don't think I ever allowed myself while I was there to even start to think, you know, Larry did something wrong because the the physical abuse became so intense at a certain point um, for me and so constant that you didn't even want to sort of uh, have the wrong expression on your face you right? Know, or else things would suddenly become really harmful. So it really became about staying in kind of lockstep and just trying to be good, um, which, you know, was very scary as a sustained hypervigilant state of mind. Exactly. It is. It's very, very much so. And it's very, very deteriorating to a brain to do that, to a mind to do that. As we saw demonstrated perhaps most effectively um, in the documentary with um, some of the other victims, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, horrified right now that I'm not remembering her name. Felicia, I think. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah, she was uh, the one who was the uh, who had actually gone through Harvard and Columbia as a medical student, psychiatric resident, and uh, within a matter of months, uh, he had reduced her down to uh, what appeared to be a fairly psychotic state uh, on video. I mean, and again, he's videoing all of this. This isn't even like we have to guess what he was doing. It's right there, and even the way he would go about doing it. Zach, I'm curious as the director, now let me, let me talk to you for a second. As the person who put all this together, first off, how? How did you go about doing all this? Because it's an impressive project and an impressive documentary you've put together on this whole sordid mess that spans a decade of time. And I am imagining quite a bit of video and written content to have to go through. How did you even approach all this and put it all together? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, there's a long, complicated answer to that. Um, okay. in, you know, in short, I think, um, you know, Daniel came to me after the New York Magazine article had come out, uh, which was April of 2019. And that was kind of the first, um, you know, sort of public uh, condemning of, of Larry and, and the atrocities he was um you know, causing. And I think um, that magazine, you know, was great in that it led to an investigation of Larry, but it left a lot of questions still on the table. And and Daniel felt a responsibility to be a part of the process of, of whatever the kind of, um, you know, format medium of a longer uh, expose on this story was going to ultimately be. And he uh, obviously... Daniel wrote a book, which was sort of his, you know, memoir, his his perspective of, of his time with Larry. And I kind of take took the, you know, torch from from Daniel and and his approach and kind of went out to some of the other uh victims, survivors, um, you know, and tried to tell a kind of multifaceted, multi-perspective um story that, you know did um, essentially allow people to really empathize with these um, victims who, you know, uh, I think throughout this felt um, that some of the media representation of cults in general is, is quite judgmental towards victims. And, mm -hmm. and I think we, uh, our approach was you know, if you can help people understand what it's like to be that age, um, you know, you're at uh, college, you're trying to define yourself. Um, what does that really feel like? Can we really remember who we were? You know, because, you know, your, your, your brain isn't fully developed. You're really still figuring, you're really encouraged to figure out who you are and, and you're, sort of innately trustworthy of individuals who are trying to help you with that journey that seems so burdensome. And then at the same time, how to understand the kind of intricacies of Larry's tactics. So it's not just this kind of magical potion, you know, this kind of magician spell, but really it's memory manipulation and things like gaslighting, which is a term we hear a lot, but the film really helps an audience like feel what it means to be gaslit, right? Because you hear 
these extended audio se- you know sections where you can feel Larry twisting the truth and turning truth in, in into fiction and and really tying knots in 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 your mind all in the sort of you know guise of of um, truth truth telling and and in order to be a better person so you know all of that is to say it was really um you know a survivor based narrative to try to really do some good in this space where I think there's a lot of learning that society has to do about what is a cult and and what do these things really feel like and and how can you empathize with people that you really feel like uh how did this happen you know how did this happen? how did this really strange thing that feels so esoteric and intangible happen and so hopefully the the this project brings you a little a little bit closer to understanding what it's like Absolutely. That's I could I, I think that was perfect as an answer that because because everything you just said is exactly what I wanted to highlight about this documentary about this experience is, is if there's any it, it's almost gaslighting 101 you really get to see how it's done and that's rare and difficult and and damn near impossible to reproduce or experiment on in the social sciences because you know you cannot create psychosis in somebody and call that a an ethical experiment so how do you do this well you have to find material like this and this material is is amazingly revelatory in how predators like Larry Ray do what they do uh, that's why I'm falling all over myself praising it because of that aspect of this it's really quite something so, because if you haven't lived it, you know, it's hard to explain it to people. They always yeah. blame you. They always want to tell you, you're the idiot. You're the stupid person. How could you have fallen for that? It's so obvious. Well, sure, when you explain it after the fact, it is. But mm-hmm. in the course yeah. of living it, it's not obvious at all. Of course, we take people at their word. Of course, we want to believe people. And I'm especially interested in the fact that Riley's daughter was was priming you guys in a way, pumping him up all the time, right? Uh, Talia. Is Talia, that, sorry. Yeah. Talia. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm yeah, I mean, I think names. that was... I've never demonstrated better how horrible I am with names than this show. But yeah. Talia was was kind of talking him up beforehand and creating a backstory for you to fill in blanks. Do you think she was doing all that on purpose? I think that Talia had been primed by her dad to act as his kind of trustworthy proselytizer. I think that if you're an 18 year old uh you know a young 18 year old man like me uh meeting another 18 year old girl a freshman in college uh who's saying you know my dad's great uh i've had a lot of friends my age throughout my life talk about how great their parents are it's it's just very trustworthy and i think that um you know shoot we talk about grooming i mean she's been groomed by her dads from the day she was born he would tell us stories about you know larry's version of this him holding her as a baby and just them staring into each other's eyes for hours which to him was like this beautiful thing to me it's like spooky like that's the beginning of him for lack of a better term like hypnotizing his daughter into becoming a mini larry which is all he ever wanted and that was very clear Right. There we go. Okay. Fair enough. Um, not seeing where it was going. I am sure you spent quite a bit of time in reflection on how could this have been, you know, how, what could you have looked for? What could you have seen or what possibly could have set off some kind of red flag that this wasn't what you thought it would be or where it was going? What have you been your thoughts about that over the years as you've looked back on this? I think that part of the hope with telling this story and telling it in the way that Zach did um, is, as we said, helping people to understand the, the reality of terms like, say, brainwashing. You know, when I, before this experience, and when I heard brainwashing, it sounded like a thing that doesn't happen to real people. And if it does, the image is like people with, you know, swirls in their eyes wandering around like zombies. Mm-hmm. You know, the reality is that it's a real human experience that's not that far away from other familiar experiences where you maybe feel peer pressure, you feel a sense of an authority expecting something from you, you know, and you're more inclined to do things or more suggestible than you would be usually, you know, so I was just a regular, 
young person. It was just an 18 year old, 19 year old man, like anyone who's listening to this, there was nothing really particularly special or unusual about me. And I had an experience that I think most people have a lot of trouble sympathizing with, um, either because it's scary or because it's been, the conversation about it has been so uh, flat and not really uh, humanizing. And so I felt like going into, you know, meeting Zach and talking about this project and and watching what he was doing uh, with our story, it was just the hope was, you know, let's make this three-dimensional um, and make people understand someone like me better. Because if I had seen this before meeting Larry Ray, I think it would have been less likely that I would have fallen for it. Or if I was in the middle of it, I would have had a model for saying, okay, what I'm experiencing is like that. You know, we're not wearing white robes. We're not drinking Kool-Aid, but you know, this is abuse. The The sexual experiences I'm having, they're non-consensual. Like, you know, just having some language and some images to put to the experience. Absolutely. Yeah. If I could add, can I add to that? Absolutely, please. Um, you know, I think... <laughs> I think what's important about a project like this is to establish in the sort of canon of what we call, you know, these cult stories, a new kind of story that's different than the others, right? Because this is like, like Daniel is saying, this is promising 18 year old, super bright, educated individuals. And you can look and you can try to find what's similar about all of them or what, you know, particular vulnerability. And, and you know, there are things that we could talk about, you know, relationships with parents and stuff. But most of it is kind of normal, everyday, 18-year-old, you know, issues, you know, issues that you would come to when, to, when you arrive at a university. And I think that the, if we could establish this story in the canon, I think, other individuals can see this as an example and 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 really you know you, you you become really alerted to situations like this i don't think we're alerted to situations like um you know man the, the manson cult because it just seems so foreign and strange i mean in the case of uh you know it'd be interesting to, to hear what you have to say about this because i do think a lot in, in Scientology is, is useful for the, the you know, greater audiences to, to understand because I'm sure it's very relatable too. But people put it in kind of a section of, well, that's not me. And I think like ultimately, if we can diversify who the me is, you know, there, there can, you know, people can really start to like think about this when they're entering in, into any kind of relationship with anyone. Exactly. I could not stress that enough. Uh, it has been a mainstay on my channel for years, and I've been doing this for about eight or eight or nine years now, that um, anybody is susceptible. Anybody can fall for this. There is no such thing as proofing yourself up against a cult except, or, and against coercive control, except to learn what coercive control is. Yeah. There, there simply isn't any other suit of armor. Your intelligence, your degrees, and this is this is what was demonstrated, so, you know, kind of as a side point, but still it was right there. You can have a Harvard graduate, Columbia trained, you know, psych resident who's right on the edge of finishing, not see what's being done to her as it's being done to her in real time she is utterly clueless that this was that she was being manipulated to the degree that she was by a you know a, a master manipulator so so the degree in the, the mind and psychology and knowing a lot of big words that's not what's going to save you you know and and i and i really i think that gets across quite well in this however i want to say having said all that it's not hopeless. It's not a case of we're all just going to fall for all the manipulators. That's why I, I that's why I enjoy talking with uh, uh, people who have been through this process is we learn some lessons along the way. And I was curious, Dan, you've obviously learned a few. <laughs> What's been your takeaway from all of this now that you're past it? The man's in jail. He's not coming out. Like that's, you've gone full circle on this thing. And it's pretty clear you've done a lot of work to make that happen. And, and Zach as well, and everybody involved with this. So now what's your takeaway from this? What do you, what do you try to tell people to, 
to, you know, not only everybody's susceptible, but then, okay, well, what do we do? How do we deal with this? How do we approach our lives differently? What do you think? Well, first of all, you know, as you referenced, I, I get to be in the very small group of people who can say that they've put their abuser in prison, the very small group of people who can say they've put a, gul a cult leader in prison. Yeah. And I, I hope that this, you know, I cannot emphasize enough how unlikely it was that this story got told at all. And I feel very confident that there's a lot of other people out there who have at least similar experiences who just didn't happen to have the series of things fall into place that allowed this story to be told uh, for them. So, I, you know, I hope that those people see this and feel some kind of hope there. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a problem with how uh, survivors of assault are represented. And I think that I expected, you know, when I think um, cult follower or when I think, you know, someone like me who's been violated, you know, I imagine someone who is broken, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important for us, for survivors of this, if we're capable of it to, you know, come onto shows like this and represent ourselves as, you know, here I am. And I, I not only survived, I'm fully living my life. My brain is working, you know, um, and I'm happy uh, to be uh, here on this earth in all of its complexity. So I want other people who've been through things like this to not feel as scared as I did to call myself a survivor, right? Because of what I thought that had to mean about me um so i think there's a lot of for me there's hope in sort of changing the narrative changing how we use a lot of this language um and in general i mean the big takeaway for me is that if we can shift to slowly shift to a world where um there's a little more empathy where we allow ourselves and our families to be a little messy and to make mistakes and to be open with each other about these things, because it's just scary to admit that something like this happened to you, that you quote unquote, let it happen to you, you know, to just make it easier to have these conversations. Like that's, that's all I want. And I believe that that's possible. Excellent. Yeah. Agreed. And the whole point of me doing my channel. So I, I agree with you completely on that. Yeah. Um, Zach, and actually for both of you, now, now that you've seen this completed product, you have, you know, you've only got so much time, you've got 10 years to condense. What is, is should, could, could I ask, are there bits that are left out that are significant or, um, didn't have time for, or you thought might be a whole different take or, you know what I mean? Anything that in this, I mean, cause there's, there's a lot of, yeah, there's here. so much, you know, I mean, there's. Honestly, this series could, you know, easily have been twice as long. I think, yeah. the, uh, you know, I will say, you know, and and one of the things that Daniel writes a, a bit about, and one of the things that's been covered in the news is, is, you know, Larry essentially was driving um, his victims towards suicide. And I think this idea of, well, what was his end goal? Um, you know, I almost think that that part of his delusion was to almost get them to 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 kill themselves. Um, and it's something that is not really talked about in this version of the story, primarily because the amount of abuse uh, that existed was purely almost just impossible to bear watching uh that it, it it just felt gratuitous to add to the list of abuses that were already being committed um you know simply having a, a victim that you're interviewing tell you about this experience is 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 traumatic for them in the moment so um you know i i felt like we only really needed to explain some of the uh, abuses that would help you understand you know the depth of of the psychology psychological control that they were under um but you know there was there were things that we didn't you know that we didn't include you know things of sexual nature things of you know more you know physical abuses this you know there were several suicide attempts and 
you know, to be honest, I, I, you know, I don't regret not having them in there. Um, but, you know, there is, the, and the other thing I'll say um, is there's a, you know, there's a lot to Larry's story that we didn't really talk about. You alluded a little bit to his past and it's pretty complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, there weren't a lot of facts that we could determine, you know, accurately from credible sources about his past. Um, and in a story where, of course, you know, uh, telling the the definitive truth um, about something is so important, uh, it just it just didn't feel like an arena that that, you know, we could, you know, without having access to you know, um, his brother didn't want to speak, um, you know, his mother, um, his ex-wife, you know, people that kind of really actually knew what Larry was, um, it, it would have been impossible to tell that story. So uh, there's certainly a lot of people that can talk to Larry's past, but um, not, you know, just not for this project, I guess. Got it. Well, interesting, because um it's not clear what it is he's exactly trying to do in this. Yeah. There's a reference to he's building an army at one point. And then I was thinking in the by the time the third, you know, episode rolls around, I'm thinking what kind of army suicide bombers? I mean it was that kind of mental place he was taking people to and i and i just can't uh, uh, you know again a lot enough the the video the memory play that he would do the way he would rewrite i mean that it really drives home that gaslighting is not just lying to people it's literally getting them in a place where you're rewriting their memories i've been there i know what that feels like it's awful it's horrifying and sorting it out, you showed how difficult that was uh, for for Santos, his whole family, right? For the parents, I mean, geez, that was just a mess trying to sort that out. What what wasn't shown there, and what I was very curious about was: were therapists involved? Was were any ant ex cult people involved? What kind of help was any help involved? Did these guys? Did these victims have to sort it all out for themselves? How did how did that process play out in the real world? I mean, I can talk about my own process. Mm-hmm. Please, I don't know, Zach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I. Oh. So as you mentioned, I was one of the first ones to get out. This was before, I mean, you know, Larry was still fully operating. Everyone was still there. So it took me quite a long time to start to sort out what had happened. It took me a long time to even call it a cult. I went to to Dan Shaw's uh, support group for ex-members in New York. um, Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. Oh, Um, I know Dan. He's a great guy. Yeah, Dan's great. Yeah. Totally wonderful. And we we had to talk to him, Zach talked to him a bit for uh this documentary, among other folks. Um and uh yeah, you know, and I had uh mixed therapy experiences, which I, I would say started um not super helpful and progressed through a couple of therapists until I found one who uh you know specializes in complex PTSD and uh, LGBTQ issues and has just been like unbelievably helpful. It's so great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, but the first therapist I talked to when I started to, this was one of the first times I was trying to tell the whole story, you know, I was having a full trauma response. My throat was closing up. I was not able to talk about it the way that I can talk about it now. And I was of course observing the look on her face and it was like her jaw dropped she had no idea what to say. Her first question was, why didn't she leave? You know, so these things, not super helpful. Um, right. Yeah, I, I think Zach could probably speak more uh, to some degree to uh, other folks' experiences and what kind of support they had as they exited. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly I can say for Santos, Yalitza, um you know, they both had therapists once, you know, it, it sort of started with legal support, um, you know, surrounding the trial. And I think their legal advisors will, were able to connect them with therapists. Um, you know, I don't know the specifics of if their therapists were specifically, you know, trained in, in course of control, but they did have, you know, support, you know, prior to, to me speaking with them. 
Um, you know, I think for Felicia, you know, it was sort of real time as I was kind of talking to her, she was kind of figuring this out and she also had legal support and also had a, a therapist during that time. You know, for me, uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Bernstein was, was hugely important. You know, I, I had really, weekly, yeah, awesome. she's been, I, I I've had her on my channel many times. She's a good friend. That's awesome. Yeah, we, you know, a, a lot of the time, I think in the beginning, we thought, um, you know, just getting information, maybe we would do on camera interviews, but Rachel had agreed to kind of do a weekly, almost um, training session with me and where I would kind of give her, you know, confidentially some of the details of the story. And she would kind of advise me on the best way to approach it, you know, what questions might be appropriate. Um, you know, which was, which was hugely helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it was real bravery, um, of course, on, on behalf of the people that participated in the documentary, you know, so that, um, and I, and I'm sure it was, and I know it was a, was a difficult process, but part of the process, I think, um, you know, in telling, their story and, and, you know, taking a real sense of ownership over it and, and sort of finding themselves again through the telling of their story and, and retreading, you know, that territory that had been, you know, trampled on and disoriented by Larry, um, you know, in some ways was cathartic. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, these survivor stories are really hard and, and I think, um, you know, I think we're all still, you know, I think there's a, a, a big push in the industry to, to, you know, do it in, in, in the right way. And, and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, this, this project adds to that conversation. Well, I think it does. I mean, I, as somebody who's been in the space for a while, I, I think it's a, I think it's very helpful. Um, like I said, I've never seen a better uh, instance of that uh, demonstration of the whole gaslighting and memory rewrite it, 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 part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot more, of course, as well. Um, oh man, I, I have so many questions throwing into my head. My difficulty right now is bringing it down to just a couple. You know, you mentioned, um, and I think it's an interesting question, you know, that I never really got to the goal or no one ever really gets to the goal like what was larry's in the game right in the army quote and and you know honestly i don't know that i arrived at an answer you know i think probably the answer and and this is kind of mentioned by the new york magazine reporter is that just that he's sick you know essentially that he's del he's delusional um you know that he's a psychopathic narcissist who um whose perversion you know is this kind of psychological control and to the you know that's what sort of gives him pleasure um and and you know i i think um you know ultimately it's like a psychological disorder and i don't know that that always has to be paired with a kind of practical um you know money certainly was a part of it sex was was a part of it, but really more control rather than actual, um, you know, or at least that's, that would be my take on it. Um, you know, so I think it, you know, it was, it, it, yeah, I would say it's like ultimately a sickness. And I think, you know, Dan, Daniel mentioned this the other day, but I think we need to understand as a society that it, that it can be a sickness. It doesn't have to be all about money. You know, it doesn't have to be that these schemes, right? Like the Keith Raniere is, is, is just for some, what was he after? Oh, money, right? He had, all these people were paying into the system. What was he after? Oh, sex purely, you know, it, it also, I think this, the, the kind of like, uh, psychological disorder needs to be a part of the conversation because there are people like this and there are people very, you know, that where it's, it's, there's varying degrees of this same, you know, kind of, um, sickness and, and maybe it's treatable. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know if in, um, you know, a hundred years from now, if, if we can speak about these things in, in a, in a slightly more nuanced way that, you know, we can, you know, hopefully, you know, figure out, um, ways of, of, you know, helping individuals that have this sickness uh, at an, at an earlier age. Um, 
Well, that's for yeah, sure. Please. I definitely agree with that. I will say that I think there are, um, I, I understand the personality disorder aspect of it for sure. I think there's personality type, if you can call it a disorder as well, of control, of a need for, urgent need for control that, that they're in, you know, their environment, they're, that the people around them and everything, if they're not under their complete control, they feel incredibly uneasy, very, very uh, even scared or terrified of people around them. And they, they feel that this is the only way they can get along in life is to control all these people. And then they find out all these fringe benefits, sex, money, power, influence, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of roll into this. And Larry seems to be somebody who had the gift of gab. And he seems to be able to have been able to tell a very interestingly coherent and logical story that made no sense. It was built on nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, Dan, how good was that from day one? He was just feeding you guys stuff or how... In, in retrospect, how premeditated does it all look? Yeah, it's a great question. So that's what's been really confusing about this process of kind of, you know, unlike a lot of people who experience things like this, I've gotten to interface with law enforcement who have been trying to corroborate and suss out what happened. I've gotten to work with Zach, you know, who's a journalist trying to figure out these things. So, you know, learning about the aspects of this that certainly do seem premeditated, you know, Larry was found with books on mind control, on coercive control, this sort of thing. You know, it seems like he was studying this before mm -hmm. he even met us. Um, you know, uh, that kind of thing is really hard to reconcile with the way it felt when I was there, which is it felt like he had a kind of virus and the virus was a delusion and it, it was driven to try to infect the rest of us in order to survive. You know, it seemed almost as if his delusion was separate from him and he was just a vessel finding out that this was maybe more of a plan is very confusing also because as I think Zach sort of references, it's not like, I mean, Larry wasn't like living lavishly, you know, he was also living in squalor in the sort of hoarding environment that he had created and blamed on us, you know, so trying to figure out what he believed and what he didn't. Um, I've a little bit given up on it. I, I, I had to give up on it while I was there in order to leave because I was sort of waiting to figure figure it all out before I left because you know I wanted to make sure I wasn't abandoning this good thing. Um, but I, I'm not sure there is a really clear answer, or if there is, I will be so fascinated to to find out one day. Absolutely, I I could not agree more. The 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 um for us ex followers right for us ex members you know what you find out first <laughs> you take some time to find out first what the fuck just happened to me mm -hmm. right and acknowledging and coming to an acceptance of that is itself really hard because mm -hmm. we have the self image of ourselves that we're not going to fall into that and then we do and we have to deal with the fact of, of the reality of that and that's hard. That's an ego, you know, popper if there ever is one. But you, but it's survivable because you can build it back up, and it's okay. And you get that's what recovery is all about. It's what we're doing. But then you start wondering, and at least I certainly have. It sounds like you too. Why did this happen to me? You know why? What the hell? And you find, unfortunately, my experience in studying this stuff for so many years has been that they're just screwing with us because they can, you know, that there's this sort of organic thing that they, that these predators, they're like sharks. I mean, they're like, they, they prey on us. And, and I don't mean that they're inhuman. I just mean, it's an aspect of our humanity that is really, truly awful. And it tends to be concentrated in these, in these, these types of people. Yeah. Well, I, I wish there was a simple answer. I, I'm not, I'm not pretending there is, I'm just saying, it's so much more awful when you realize that it's just happenstance and it just organically sort of rolls out and the person's just messing with you to see how far they can go. And it turns out they can keep going for a really long time, you know, before yeah. we clue in. Yeah, I mean, I when I left, assumed that everything would collapse. It seemed so unsustainable. And yeah. so when I was first contacted by reporters about six years after I had left and found, you know, I just hoped 
that, you know, if I could leave, surely it would be possible for my friends to similarly leave. I, a part of why I didn't leave was because I didn't want to leave people behind in the same situation and had to eventually give up on the idea that I could make this all fall apart. I had to give up on the idea that I was going to get my stuff back from him, you know, this kind of thing. Right. Um, and so the fact that he managed to keep it going, even though it was so chaotic for so long, was completely uh, shocking to me. I, I also want to say that it was very clear from the beginning that Larry was just a different kind of human being. You know, I think we all, I feel like, you know, I grew up learning sort of the cadence of a conversation. And if you know the feeling of kind of looking for a moment of pause when someone else is saying something to kind of now is your turn to speak that feeling of waiting for a pause to speak uh, was the feeling I had with Larry Ray for, you know, just sustained for years. Like he had no, he did not hew to any regular social standards or it's just like he had the ability to ignore everything that we learn about etiquette, respecting other people, all of that. And I think that people, some people might like to believe that they could kind of let go of those things, but he just, I think it's a lot harder than uh, than we can imagine, and you have to have some different structures in your brain for it to be possible. And and Larry did. I, I agree completely. In fact, let me ask you: Was that kind? Was his? Well, he'd been built up a little bit. Then he appears. He just got out of jail, and yet somehow through his words and deeds, and and also if I remember right from the from the documentary, he was buying you guys steak dinners and stuff too. Like there was some, there was some, um, well, what we call trauma bonding. You know, there was a lot of positivity at the beginning before there was all this negativity. Did that was that, would you say that that was curious or even fascinating to you? at that time, you know, in terms of being drawn in by him? Did that aspect of his non-mannered, non-etiquette kind of approach, was that something of a, oh, that's interesting. I want to find out more about this guy. Yeah, I think, you know, it's pretty easy looking back on it now when we have all of, you know, this like video of the abuse, everything to say, you know, why wouldn't you suspect this guy? But I think it's pretty simple. You know, what Larry worked really hard to do is just like obviate the possibility that he was a threat. So it was just my friend's dad. And then you just, all it takes is you've got a bunch of college students who are kind of hungry. They're on the meal plan. They're eating at the mess hall or whatever. It's not very good. And this guy shows up, you know, the house where we live is a mess because we're 18, 19 and don't know how to take care of ourselves. And, you know, he says, here, I'm going to buy everyone meals from the fancy Italian restaurant uh, in town every night, and I'm going to clean up your house and take care of everything, you know, so you can continue to just be 19-year-olds and don't worry about it, but also, um, you know, I'm going to provide the kind of comfort and support that you were used to from having parents at home. Um, so, you know, he just filled a, a gap that we were supposed to be learning to fill for ourselves. Uh, but, you know, a huge relief to just have something nice to eat without having to figure it out yourself. Yeah, exactly. Did it help his efforts that he was a fairly imposing, stocky guy? Uh, certainly later. Yeah, later on when, um, you know, I experienced real physical harm from him and, you know, he became very threatening. And then you know, the person who hurts you inflates in your memory. So he just became this kind of wall of a man in my mind and was very scary. Um, seeing him at the sentencing, you know, which just happened a couple weeks ago, um, it was the first time I was in a, a room with him in about a decade. And, you know, it still, to me, felt like, an, a kind of a big man, but um, just a man, you know, which helped. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it, it brings a lot of things to mind I wanted to ask you about. So thank you. It, it, very much that moment. I can only imagine for myself right now what that moment might feel like is to see a David Miscavige, you know, in an orange jumpsuit or something. Uh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. What What was, I mean, did you feel... Have you felt closure on this? Have you felt 
you were able to kind of lay this thing to rest at some point? Yeah. I, I mean, the short answer is yes. I, I think I have. It's There's been so many steps in this process and my focus for so long has been just trying to get my friends safe, trying to create the circumstance where they could make themselves safe. And so, you know, it's hard to process for myself, you know, how do I feel seeing Larry, you know, in a jumpsuit, hearing that he's going to prison for 60 years, but sitting there and watching Felicia and Lee and Santos to see that family come back together and see them all hugging each other and laughing. And, you know, we all went out for a meal afterwards, you know, seeing my friends safe, um, yes, does give me a, a sense of closure. Excellent. I Perfect. Uh, absolutely perfect. Um, how has that, how ha are you guys all back in touch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, since a after Larry was uh, convicted, I've been able to get back in touch with everyone um, to Good. different degrees. It's a funny thing to have your life completely blown up and then to cross this kind of chasm and find each other on the other side and then have to renegotiate, you know, we have this shared experience that only we can truly fully understand. And also we're adults and human beings who are trying to figure out our lives. And, you know, so these are like my college friends, but they're also my cult friends. It's a, it's a very odd, it's not a very good roadmap for that. <laughs> Tell yeah. me about it. <laughs> I so yeah. understand. Um, Okay, Zach, maybe you could um, maybe you could ask on this one or answer on this one as well. Is um, it seemed at the end I was a little unsure where uh, Isabella was going because she seemed to still be allied with his worldview and and the and all the things that have been kind of done to her. Did that change in the real world after production, or is she still going down that path? Um. Well, as of us finishing the movie, um, you know, a few months ago, she had pled guilty um, to that's right conspiracy conspiracy to money laundering, um, and you know, her legal situation kind of changed, and so our communication changed. Um, but um, recently there are uh, court documents that were released um that you know show that she's now um condemning larry and her own kind of um responsibility in 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 what happened um so we'll see her sentencing is in a few weeks um but it, it's very it's it's incredibly promising news um because you know it, it definitely shows that um you know over the course of her time with with her legal support and and therapy support that that she is you know um starting a new chapter at least that's what we hope for so um we'll see what happens but yeah basically when we when we stopped the film um you know she she later, you know, ended up pleading guilty to to um, conspiring to money laundering. Right. And that was connected with, just for the audience to, to understand, that was connected with sex trafficking because Larry Ray was basically pimping out one of these, one of his victims and uh, demanding the money from her to the tune of over a million dollars in one year. I mean, it was shocking. Uh, seeing that, but it really demonstrated also another aspect of this we haven't really touched on, but I think we should is the victim victimizer thing, because that's a problem for ex cult members, which certainly was for me and for many, many people I've spoken to, where you're part of a group where which is doing horrible, terrible things to you. And you are truly a victim of this. I mean, that there's no question about it. And there's no other word to use to describe it yet at the same time, because of the mindset change and all the gaslighting and everything else and the moral foundations that get rewritten as a result of that, you end up becoming a victimizer too. And you're victimizing other people and you are 100% guilty of that. And you got to learn how to deal with that too as part of this whole process. 
I, you know, now, Dan, it wasn't particularly obvious in, in the documentary that that was your story so much as it was, you know, some of the people who stayed with him for longer, but it's a factor of this. And I'm curious, how has that come up and been dealt with by y'all, um, you know, as part of this process? Yeah. So, I mean, there's all different forms of shame and guilt, which work to uh, both sustain the pretty seemingly unsustainable structure of a cult like this. Um, and that also make it hard to leave. Right. So um, the feeling of culpability uh, while I was there for the ways that um, I had participated, the things that I had witnessed and let happen. Um, I think for my friends, there was, a, you know, I joined after Santos and after Claudia. And so for them, there was processing the feeling that they maybe were responsible for pulling other people in, which is its own thing, right? Yep. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're very familiar with the feeling, you know, in a group like this, there's a hierarchy created, the abuser's always at the top, and there's someone always at the bottom who's the scapegoat, and all you want is to not be that person, and they kind of cycle. Um, yep. So this creates this kind of lateral feeling where you're like jockeying to not be the bad one. Um, and there's a pressure to kind of, it's like being in a, like North Korea or something. Everyone's watching everyone else. Um, and, and there's an eagerness at a certain point that maybe varies from person to person, but an eagerness to kind of snitch, quote unquote, on yes. each other because then you're good. Um, so all these things are really hard to process. I will say, you know, for Larry's sentencing, he submitted documents talking about his childhood abuse, and that was meant to be an explanation uh, for what he did. And my first thought about that, you know, because I've been thinking for a long time about where do we draw the line? You know, where do we say, well, you're not culpable because you went through this thing? And I'll say, you know, whether or not Larry was abused as a child, you know, we all experienced abuse at his hands, and all of us are just trying to take that experience and do good in the world and help other people or just live. And, you know, so I think that there is a difference. Um, I don't think that Isabella would have done what she did if she hadn't met Larry, you know, right. I think that means something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it's a struggle. It's a struggle mm -hmm. for all of us, you know, to deal with that, to deal with that, with that balance of, well, I, I, I ended up doing some really screwed up things too. And now I got to deal with that, you know, and we, and we do what we do and we, and we figure it out. I'm not, I, I'm not in any way implying, you know, there should be jail time or something, you know what I mean? It's not even going there. It's just the psychological aspect of part of the recovery is dealing with that, with that fact. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really interesting, I mean, Isabella is a really interesting case because she's, facing, you know, five years of jail time. And she basically submitted letters, you know, to the judge asking to not have jail time because, you know, she is admitting that, you know, she was victimized by Larry um, and that she wouldn't have done, you know, these things otherwise. And so I you know, think it, I don't actually know, you know, what, what the judge uh, will say, and I don't know the precedent for this kind of thing. I don't know that there is a lot of precedent for it. So it'll be really interesting. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. Yeah. Did you have another view about that? You no, I mean, I have like personal opinions on it. You know, I, 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 I view her as a, as a victim, of course, and and I, I, I don't really want to see her go to jail uh, personally. Um, you know, but I also know that you know there's a justice system that you know re re you know requires there to be punishments for things that you know take place, and the idea of undue influence isn't one that is quite you know fully under i don't know uh, used um legally or understood yet in our system so i i think it's like new territory and um you know it'll be interesting to see what happens it will it'll be very interesting in fact i'm curious are either of you aware of the of the 2016 law that was passed in the united kingdom surrounding domestic violence and coercive control yeah, I, I am aware of that law, and um, Felicia and I have actually had some conversations with Steve Hassan, who I know who is very sort of up on that, and and he was talking to us a bit about this, and I think is really a campaigner for trying to change legislation over here. 
um, yeah, I think it's a gray area in the law. It's a clearly a gray area in sort of the social discourse. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can be a part of, um, pushing these conversations forward. Yeah, I think that's exactly what this documentary and what your story does and is doing. And that's why I want to, I wanted to, that's why I wanted to have you on my show to be part of that. So I was very, very appreciative of, of being given this opportunity. So I want to wrap up now. We, we have reached our time. So I'm going to, uh, to start wrapping up the show, but I want to thank you again, both of you for taking the time to talk to people like me, promote your 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 thing, but really get into the details of these stories because they are important, and there are and and, and people need to know that how this stuff works and and why, so that they don't fall into it. And on that happy note, any last thoughts you all want to share with my audience about this topic and about you know your your future plans or where you where you think we should go with this? Zach. Um. <laughs> As far as, you know, what I hope happens, you know, I, I think, um, you know, hopefully the, the, the series is, you know, seen by a, a diversity of people who, um, you know, gain a greater understanding of, of course of control and what it's like to be in the situation. And, and hopefully it's, normal it's more it's normalized you know i think if you can normalize um the idea of being in a cult um you know that that will go a long way to to protecting uh you know people potentially getting into these kinds of relationships so um i think that's what we hope is that the you know the film is kind of widely accepted and it doesn't sort of become a you know a, a fringe topic um but people can you know both at the same time learn something and and sort of be compelled um, and, and captivated by the the story itself. Yeah. Cool, Dan. Any last comments? Yeah, I mean, it's mostly just echo what Zach said. I think that you know we're hoping, I hope uh, that we start to push towards a world where the experience of cult abuse of coercive control is a little bit more absorbed into sort of the broader lexicon. Um, uh, the ways that conversations around domestic violence, around uh, sexual abuse, these conversations have shifted really dramatically in just the last couple of decades. Um, and, and I think that it feels like uh, the cultural consciousness around cults is a little behind and the, the uh, sympathy that's extended to cult survivors is lacking. Um, but it's far more widespread than I, I think folks really want to give credit to or believe. And I can't tell you the number of people since starting to tell this story who have popped up in my life, people I already knew who turned out to have similar experiences, people I encounter every day. It's like everyone I sit next to on a plane has had some kind of similar experience, uh, you know, whether or not that's a form of childhood abuse or something more directly related to a cult uh, or a workplace or, or what have you. So, you know, I just think we need to expand this conversation. Big time, big time. Well, thank you both for taking the time to do this. And uh, on that note, we will wrap up. Folks out there, thank you very much for coming around and listening to us go on about this. I truly hope that uh, you will check out this documentary. Again, it is called Stolen Youth. It is on Hulu. It, it uh, starts February 9th it's, is when it drops. Uh, and I really can't recommend it enough. It's about three hours of, of your time and you will learn things you definitely do not know right now uh, that are quite illuminating and fascinating. So check that out. And on that, I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.